At the Department of Mechanical and Industrial Engineering, we take pride in our rich history of excellence. Our researchers are leading the way in countless fields, three of which we'll highlight tonight, health, energy, and robotics. I'm proud to share the stage tonight with three of our world-class researchers, Professors Craig Simmons, Goldie Nijet, and David Sinton, as well as three industry leaders, Mitesh Badiwala, Pat Malucci, and Chris Trick Mosi. And I would like to give my heartfelt gratitude to our moderator tonight, University Professor Edward Sargent, Vice Dean of Research at the Faculty of Applied Science and Engineering at U of T. Thanks to our panelists for joining us today. Uh, well, first, just before we get going, and I'll ask a couple questions to our panelists, I wanted to let the audience know that uh, you will have a chance to ask questions as well. I have a couple of questions of my own first, though, and I'm gonna start over there with, uh, with Craig. And uh, Craig, you and your team are right at the forefront of the field of biomedical engineering, and it's an incredibly exciting forefront to be at. What, in your view, are the grand challenges of that field? If we could understand how the brain is wired, we could understand how the brain is controlled, we could perhaps reverse engineer the brain. For mechanical engineers, we could now start thinking of plugging into the brain and having neural uh, prostheses run uh, through thought and really tapping right into the, to the nervous system that way. Uh, I think the other area is regenerative medicine. Uh, re you know, the challenge there is can we replace uh, body parts where right now we use synthetic materials, plastics, metals, things that really aren't living, replace them with living re replacement tissues, living tissues that will grow with a child, for example, or uh, adapt as someone uh, goes through life. So I think that's the other challenge. I think U of T is particularly strong in that area. Uh, we have uh, the, uh, a program called Medicine by Design, which is a big program that's uh, focused on regenerative medicine and, and coming up with designer tissues. And then we just launched just this week the Translational Biology and Engineering Program as part of the Ted Rogers Center for Heart Research. And a focus of that program is to uh, come up with strategies to regenerate cardiovascular tissues and heart tissue. And to, as I said, instead of using plastic and metal valves, perhaps we can use a living valve instead. For babies that are born with a congenital heart valve defect, that's a, that would be a huge step forward. T tell us more, Craig. I want to in particular talk about, um, it, let's take the babies, for example, born with a heart defect. Uh, how, is, how is medicine practiced in that area today? And if you're successful in five or 10 or 15 years, how could it be different? How could the experience of the patient be different? Yeah, so right now, and I think Dr. Badawala can correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is that uh, babies who are born with a congenital heart defect or heart valve defect, uh, they often require surgery early in life. The materials that are used to repair that valve include things like fabrics, synthetics like Dacron, um, or, and, and those, those fabrics don't last a lifetime. They, they stiffen up, they have to be replaced, and the baby might have to, have to undergo multiple operations. What we're imagining is what if instead of doing that, we could take stem cells from the umbilical cord of the baby, so the baby's own cells, and we could combine those with a biomaterial, and we could maybe put them in a bioreactor in the lab and use mechanical forces to exercise that growing tissue to become a, 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 you know, a robust heart valve tissue. And then that could be put back into the baby. That could be used instead of a synthetic uh, material. Okay, well, thank you. Last question for you before we um, move to Mitesh. Um, uh, it sounds incredibly exciting. It sounds incredibly interdisciplinary. What role does the mechanical engineer have to play in this? Good question. I think and it is incredibly disciplinary. So it doesn't, it, you know, mechanical engineering alone won't solve it, and we have to collaborate with the physicians and biologists and biomaterial scientists. Our perspective is you know, a lot of these tissues we're trying to replace are mechanically active tissues. The heart beats, the heart valves open and close, uh, and they flap, and they're under stress, and they're under strain. And the forces that are applied to these tissues help these tissues grow and maintain the healthy status. So in the case of the heart valve regeneration, we're actually using mechanical forces, as I said, to exercise the tissue. So it's very much like you go to the gym and lift weights and your muscles get bigger. We can do the same thing with growing or engineered tissues. We can apply mechanical forces and those tissues can become more mechanically robust and then able to sustain the forces and demands that would be put on them when they're put back in the body. 
Wonderful. Well, that transitions beautifully over to Dr. Badiwala. Um, Mitesh, can you uh, tell us a bit about how you see the future cardiac surgery five or ten years out? minimally invasive valve replacement technologies. We used to have to make a big long incision, put a patient on a heart lung machine, put them through the stress and strain of surgery, um, and largely it was only the younger patients who could get through that. In our older patients now we can do transcatheter valve replacements through needle sticks, um, which is revolutionary technology and is changing the landscape. In other areas of cardiac surgery, um, the traditional operations are becoming more and more easy. And in exciting areas, such as robotic cardiac surgery, there's now technology that's being developed for us to operate with robots on a beating heart, whereby the robots move with every heartbeat and allow the visual feel to be still for the surgeon. So these are all revolutionary and exciting technologies. The other area of cardiac surgery which I'm more interested in, which will totally revolutionize um, heart care, is heart replacement technology and advances in transplantation. Um, there's nothing better out there than a, your own human heart or a donated human heart. The challenge is we don't have enough donor hearts to replace failing hearts. And, and other, t other areas that we're working on are areas where we can take hearts out of donors who we normally would wouldn't, but then reanimate, regenerate, repair organs outside of the body, and then reimplant them. If you think about it, many, many years down the road, hopefully in my lifetime, there may come a day where we take a, a diseased heart out of a patient, replace it temporarily with a pump, but then repair their own heart outside of their body, and then retransplant it. That would be kind of sci-fi fiction at this point, but if you think about things we thought were science fiction 20, 30 years ago, it's stuff we're doing today. Well, I want to continue with the theme of robotics that you've taken us into and, and moved to Goldie, and talk a bit about how robotics can and increasingly are uh, contributing to help us deal with uh, questions uh, of health and, and also social questions related to aging. Goldie. We've been focusing on developing robots that can you know, live in your home and help you with activities of daily living as you age. So that would be you know, prompting you through steps of getting up in the morning to remember do you brush your teeth, how do you brush your teeth, getting dressed in the morning, making a meal and actually eating it. So we promote aging in place as well as we're looking at using robots um, to provide simulation during leisure activities and a lot of older adults are isolated from their families and friends and that has negative impacts right on your health and so can we use robots to provide recreational activities that uh, older adults can engage in and through that back and forth kind of interaction we improve um, social stimulation as well as cognitive stimulation. So when you talk of recreational activities are you talking squash, ping pong, badminton, which ones in particular? Oh yeah it could be a wide range, um, anywhere from the physical exercises as well as games. Um, so a lot of focus has been on, for example, memory games, card games. Um, we also do bingo, um, where it's a group activity. So we have a robot facilitate a bingo activity with a number of older adults and calls out the bingo numbers, celebrates with you if you win. You can call the robot over to check your card so the robot knows if you're cheating or not. And so we have this back and forth interaction. And then with that, we hope that having multiple people in interacting with the robot, we also improve social interactions between the group. You know, it sounds so it sounds so exciting and it's addressing such a demographic trend that's so important and that has economic implications, which is, you know, the demographic shift in, in our country and around the world. Um, are there downsides? Should we be worried and should we be trying to address those downsides today? So there's been a lot of discussion about the rise of the robots. Um, really, we're looking at designing robots. And as roboticists, as a society, you know, we focus on designing robots to improve quality of life. And you know, there's, there's something called the three Ds, the dirty, dull, and dangerous jobs that nobody wants to do, really. Um, we look at using robots in those roles where you know, there's, people just don't want to do them. And it you know, improves your health by you not having to do those activities. Are these robots going to take over the world? Probably not. Remember, we're in control of what we want these robots to do and design them to do those tasks. Right now, robots can really do one task. They can do one task really well, but that's about it. 
Well, thank you. I, you know, given that you've talked so much about, about this revolution, I guess there's questions about how it's going to be enabled and the underlying technologies. Uh, sounds to me like communications and, and uh, computing capacity is going to be important and needs to be widespread. So I want to move to, to Ted and hear a bit about um, are, are this, is the city of the future, is the condo building of the future uh, going to have the kind of connectivity and capacity to uh, enable uh, these and other applications like the ones Goldie's talked about? Well, I started on a journey probably about 10 years ago. Obviously, we build housing, we build multifamily units, condos, and we build seniors' buildings. And then 10 years ago, we started to look, well, how do we build that next generation home? And the next generation home, you know, technology is fundamentally a part of it. The communications are good, your phone works everywhere, cell phone, you have great Wi-Fi, you've got great connectivity, you want to live there. Your whole home experience is on a phone and you get the picture and that's kind of, that's the home of the future. And all the work that we did, and thankfully Tridal actually has been building smart seniors buildings and moving in that direction, moving that way with the condos. But all that work and with the industry partners we've been working with, we started to get involved a lot with the cities and starting to develop communication policies for smart cities and getting connectivity. So now everybody might be wondering, why do I keep talking about connectivity? And, and I guess it's, it also brings to the point, why do I like hanging out with people like this? Because I hear what they're doing. The stuff that Goldie's doing, the stuff that we do with sensor-based technologies, we know there's not enough people to look after the aging population. We know we need these robots. We know we need sensor technologies. All that stuff depends on networks. If we don't build the buildings right, you can't do all this really cool stuff. So along with a group of people, that's really what we've been advocating and pushing for across Ontario, and even across North America. Ultimately, we just want to be ahead and we want to stay in tune with the rest of the world. You need networks and buildings for this stuff to work, and that's why we've been pushing for it so hard. Wonderful, you talked about sensors. Tick is, tell us about that. What's the, what's the opportunity there for kind of ubiquitous sensing within and beyond the smart city? You, you know, one guy I was working with from Samsung, he put it best, you take a smart home system, and a smart home system has a few basic things. It has a gateway you can plug any sensor to. It has a presentation layer that shows something to a person, can notify a nurse, and you got smart people running analytics against that. Now you can do anything you want. You got, you've got a research platform, and at the University of Toronto, there's all kinds of amazing things that they've been developing, like a fall-down camera. Someone's fallen down, it uh, sees they've fallen down using video analytics, starts calling to them, they don't move, it starts texting and phoning everyone. Or one I just saw on a couch, they have two copper plates sitting underneath the fabric fabric, somebody sitting on top of the couch with all their clothes on and it's, and, it's, and it's doing the vitals. I mean, that's the kind of stuff, but that won't work unless you can actually connect it. So that's kind of going back to the smart home. The smart home eventually will be the virtual nurse. Wonderful. Thanks so much. Uh, I'm going to move over to, to Professor Dave Sinton. Uh, Dave, your work uh, touches broadly on the incredibly important field of energy, and it includes both uh, work in the area of fossil fuels and their extraction, and also in the area of clean tech. Um, you might look at that superficially and say these are in opposition with each other. Uh, why can't you pick one? <laughs> Right, great question. Um, so I'll start on the, on the renewable side. I think the motivation there is, is obvious to, to everyone. That's the future, and as Ted mentioned, that's, that's a big role for universities, right? Looking ahead and developing next generation technologies. So we're excited about using renewable energy and using solar energy to take this waste product CO2 and turn it into uh, useful products, hopefully high value products. Why not stop there? Why not focus exclusively on, on that? Uh, and, and this realization came a few years ago, um, but the key point is that the energy system changes slowly. Particularly in the Canadian context, we've got large energy, current energy operations, and they could use our help. And I think uh, it certainly deserve a, a portion of, of my group's focus to look at near term, how can we help these guys uh, fix their two black eyes? They have two black eyes, right? They have economics, they're too expensive. And, uh, and environmental performance is very poor. Too much CO2 um, generated when they take uh, bitumen out of the ground. Right? So um, we think it's an important focus to help them reduce their CO2 impact of those operations uh, because they'll be with us for the near term. Energy system is slow to change. And that's just because of the infrastructure intensive nature of it. 
is Toronto the right place for this research to be happening, especially on the fossil fuel side? I mean, the, the, the oil patch in Canada is famously out west. Uh, why U of T? I guess, it, I guess um, you know, our connection there is just we have special tools that apply. Uh, so we can offer something that's unique. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm on the mechanical engineering world, I'm on the fluid side, and I'm on the microfluids side. And, uh, and we have a lot of great um, uh, tools, optical and microfabrication, that to some extent have been paid for by, by Craig's community in the biomedical side, looking at, looking at uh, microfluidic lab on chip technologies. But we can really inform what they're doing uh, and what's happening underground, high pressures, high temperatures, some of what Goldie was talking about, dirty, dangerous stuff, or at least two of the three Ds, um, these chips are good at, at, at showing what's happening down there. Wonderful, thank you. It's very exciting. I want to move to Chris and, and talk more about energy, but, but I want to move to uh, another uh, low-carbon source, which is nuclear energy. Um, can you tell us a bit about your vision of the future of nuclear energy in particular? Uh, can it become acceptable to the public, and how will that happen? Well, that, that's a very important and interesting question, and it has many dimensions. <clears throat> I think we have to start with the fact that the press has really scared us with two things. One is cost, and the other is safety, um, both of which are perfectly manageable. The nuclear industry is actually the safest way of generating power that we have. But the, the key issue really is cost. How do you get the costs under control? And I'm an advocate of doing things on small scale. There's been a lot of interesting work around small uh, nuclear uh, generators, say five to 50 megawatts. Uh, you have a whole different uh, approach to things available. You can build them as modular units. You can build them in factories rather than at site. You can do your quality control properly and you can deliver something that's uh, ultimately risk-free. And there are a lot of different uh, cycles in the generation for nuclear fuel being developed. Some of them here in Canada. It's a really interesting time. My other way to answer it is we're perfectly comfy with nuclear medicine. I don't know about you guys, but I've had uh, our friends in the medical field shoot nuclear stuff inside me. I'm still here and they turned out the lights. I don't think I glow. We're perfectly comfy with nuclear medicine, um, but the key is with the, the proliferation of safe nuclear power being generated elsewhere, with the nuclear medicine, with uh, small uh, generators, maybe uh, of the five to 50 megawatt scale proliferating around the world, I think people will get the message that this is a, a potential path to follow. So uh, many people view the storage of energy as critical to having renewables take on a really major portion of our total energy demand fulfillment. Um, what's your sense of, of the field of storage, um, the problems there, the challenges, and then are there exciting technologies that you have in your view uh, that you think could make a real impact on that field? I think it's a very exciting time right now because uh, as, as Dave alluded to, the, the cost of solar panels is now becoming competitive. Um, windmills have been around for a long time, and the grid is now becoming the problem. How do you manage the grid with all this intermittency? And batteries, uh, sorry, storage in a broader sense is the only way. I'm excited about two, really. One is hydrogen, and I don't know how many of you know, but at the mechanical engineering department when I was here, Dave Scott started the Hydrogen Institute. That's 50 years ago, right here at U of T. But uh, you know, hydrogen is an obvious approach because it's then a, a clean fuel for those that want to use it. Um, the, the thing that personally gets me excited because I've come from the mining side of the business is uh, vanadium pentoxide redox uh, flow batteries because the atmospheric pressure, the atmospheric temperature, and their pumps and tanks and all you're doing is going from one valence state of vanadium to another, and infinitely scalable. And they're operating already at the eight megawatt hour scale, which is a pretty good size scale, and discharging uh, typically 200 kilowatts, but maybe if you gang them, you can get two megawatts. These are big units by most scales. 
So uh, to me, scalability is the ultimate issue. But again, right now it's cost that's uh, the impediment with membranes. It's always the material scientists holding us up. <laughs> but uh, I think we're at a very interesting crossroads because it's now one of the bottlenecks in the energy system. All right, I'm going to move to a free-for-all of questions from the audience. We've got some good ones here. And uh, I don't know if people got the message to write their own names here, but this question is from Goldie. And I think I might know who it's for. Goldie hails from, she came all the way over from St. George and College today to be with us. And uh, Goldie, the question is for you. Uh, which, country is, which country will be the earliest adopter of interactive robots? That's a great question, Goldie. Um, so, <laughs> well, I think we're right at the forefront right now where we have a lot of different countries, including Canada, you know, looking into using robots. And, and as one application we talked about was, of course, for elderly, you know, these socially assistive robots. So we can say that the Japanese have, you know, already accepted robots into society, um, just as it's been a part of their culture for a while, from entertainment purposes, now, you know, looking into other applications um, beyond that, uh, into health and so on. So I would say that they have accepted it, but I would say that, you're, I would say that the North Americans, your Europeans, are not far behind. So when we started our studies, you know, 10 years ago, our first study, um, we had but first, you know, a lot of questions saying, well, why would you want to take robots to, you know, to long-term care facilities, and how will people react? Won't you scare the residents? And it was quite the opposite. When we took them in, people, you know, were very interested in the robots. They wanted to see what the robots could do, and they understood that the robots could potentially meet their needs, because the robots give that one-on-one -on -one, um, care that they really do need. And everyone who has dementia has different symptoms or groups of symptoms, so you can't kind of group people together. So the robots provide this personalized care because they're able to interact with you, know what you're trying to do, understand your emotions, and react to that. And so I would say, you know, collectively as the world, we're embracing them, but Japan started early. Wonderful. Thank you. I'm going to make no attempt at coherence and just jump to my next favorite question. And uh, this one is not addressed to any particular individual. Uh, so this is open field. Anybody can jump in. Those are the rules. And the question is, what is the car of the future? And again, don't worry about your, your expertise, your background. Actually, if you're a cardiovascular surgeon, I mean, cardiovascular surgeons drive nice cars, right? I mean, so anybody can jump in. What's the car of the future? Sure, I'll, I'll take a quick step. I think uh, for um, for small-scale transport cars uh, that transport passengers, I think uh, electric cars are exciting and and uh, and hopefully will be very successful. Um, I think also the self-driving thing maybe gets to maybe this goalie be the right one to answer this, but uh, but that's interesting, exciting. One 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 quirk on that that I'm curious about is what that does to cities. Um, does that mean, if I have a self-driving car, I, I have two questions. One is, I suspect I want a really big one because I'm gonna lounge in the back, right? <laughs> uh, and then I, which is not good from an energy perspective. And, um, and then I also suspect that I don't mind living further away because I'm so comfortable. So I wonder what that will do to my downtown property value or other things. So Dave, would you rather have a self-driving car or a robot that drives your car? <laughs> Well, I'm not sure. I, I thought they'd be the same. Or, you know, the robot is sort of in the uh, in the uh, vehicle one way or the other. So you can take that robot out to do other things, like when you go grocery shopping, take the groceries into the house with sure. you. <laughs> sure, sounds good. You know, the one thing I would want to add, again, when you hang out with the students and you look at them, they don't want to own cars. They're all using car share. They're naturally doing car share. So I really think the car of the future is you don't really even care to own your own car. The car comes, picks you up, and you and you use it. You share them, and you see. And, and the other thing I find with that next generation, I think they're less and less about, you know, my fancy car. We've been questioned in homes. Are they going to want to own a home or they're going to just want to rent a home so that they don't, they're not tied down and they're moving. So I think, you know, we can't use the way we feel at our age and what we were brought up with to project that to the future because the future to them, I don't think they're going to care. And I think they were just fine with some little car, some little smart car. I need to get over there, picks me up and it's efficient and self-driving. And that's what I would say. Yeah, Ted, I'm with you 100%. The average car is used 2% of the time. 
which means there's a huge, huge overcapacity. Now, don't tell GM that, they get rather nervous <laughs> if you're not gonna be <laughs> buying cars, but. Uh, so I don't think we're gonna own cars in the future. I don't think we're gonna need them. And then congestion goes away and cities become much, much more livable, I would suggest. Wonderful. Well, I'm happy to declare that you can ask this panel anything, and they will have an answer. I assure you of that. I'm going to jump to the next topic, and Jordan is trying to put Ted Malucci on the spot. You ready for it, Ted? I'm ready. All right. So uh, the question is is this. The energy footprint and the carbon footprint of the construction industry is, is a significant one. Uh, how, is the, how is the sector going to change um, to be more environmentally responsible in its own practices as it uh, builds the building of the future? Future, it builds a smart building. I mean, there's a lot of progress in that already with what they're doing with lead locally sourced. Um, there's, there's, I guess, only so far you can go to improving that, but there is a lot of efforts that are going towards that. I guess a comment I'd want to make is that there's been huge leaps and bounds in the efficiency of buildings, but mainly because the way we used to build them was absolutely barbaric. We just did stupid stuff. Like if you looked at it, you went to a parking garage, One, just one simple example, you would have an exhaust fan running all day to clear the CO. Then someone put a $20 sensor on and it runs 1% of the time, and that's what we're fighting against. But the whole smart building thing I think plays into this too, because once you put a network in, a building can sense and it can optimize, and we can actually improve that, because I think buildings consume 40% of all energy, I believe that's the statistic. So smart buildings, technology, all the different things that we hear talking about, we can start to improve that and lower that. But the actual build, I think we can get so far, but you know, you're not gonna get to perfect. You still gotta move materials, it's still being built largely by human hands. Thank you. So somebody else is gonna get put on the spot now, his name is Dave Sinton. James, not his real name, James asks, um, is James my grad student? Probably, <laughs> yeah, that one, yeah. <laughs> James uh, uh, notes that you, you there is this uh, big uh, smackdown of the slowness of the traditional energy sector to change. Could that have something to do with the fact that you renewable people aren't moving fast enough, but coming up with new technologies that actually get out there are actually useful or are actually practical? Oh, I think you know. There's, there's always part of that. Maybe you could, you could say, oh, well, researchers are, are going to chase the next coolest thing and not necessarily um, push that tech, you know, the last thing through the what they call the valley of death for technologies, right? Um, uh, certainly it's imaginable, but, but my sense is that that criticism isn't too well-founded. It's, it's more the issue of, of, of the challenges of scaling. Um, renewable technologies, uh, you know, that are addressing this, A, giving us energy, but B, in a non-carbon intensive way, are just really hard, right? That's, otherwise they would have been conventional energy technologies, because it would have made money right away and they would have been easy. Um, so I think that's, that's the bigger part of it. We're doing great work. <laughs> <laughs> so don't worry. <laughs> we're doing all we, we're doing what we can. All right. Back to Goldie, who's getting a lot of attention today. This is from Timoteus. Timoteus asks, the com data, combination of big data and machine learning uh, have applications to everything that we've talked about tonight, but in particular uh, to your field. What do you think that these topics could do for you? And then after this, I'm going to open up to anybody who wants to comment on the potential impact of big data and machine learning in your field. But we'll start with Goldie. That's a great question. Um, so definitely you can see great applications of the two in, into robotics. If I start, let me start with the second one. Uh, machine learning is a huge component of getting robots to really be integrated into society. We don't want to change our world in order to have the robots help us. We, we want robots to be integrated and we call these human-centered environments, right? We want them to come in. And in order for them to be able to do that, they need to learn about the environment and the people in the environment. So machine learning is an important important aspect of that where robots can start reasoning about what they see or who they see um, from anywhere from, you know, this is, uh, I would say, a glass of water and water is used to drink and so on. And that we can help build the intelligence of these robots. And I, as I mentioned, robots are really good at doing one task and they do it really well. That can extend it to now robots can do multiple tasks for us because they can learn about these other tasks. And big data is, is similar to the idea, and as um, Ted Malucci was mentioning, we can use it in having groups of robots and robots integrated into communities, um, not only 
just the house, but you know, if you're thinking about the city, you know, with these smart cities, and, and using that information in order for these robots to communicate with each other and other sources of um, devices that are out there and, and sharing that information. So it will be great to have that knowledge base for robots to use. Well, I'm going to jump over to these guys with the next question, um, which actually wasn't narrowly uh, addressed to you, but I'm going to address it too, which is Bart asks, how are we ensuring knowledge transfer between disciplines and between academia and industry? Maybe some examples from your domains. I guess one of the ways is going to research meetings. We always have the cardiovascular meeting, and it's every time I go to the Canadian Cardiovascular Congress, I'm impressed by um, the members and the attendees from a diverse uh, array of disciplines. Now we have engineers who are showing up at the meeting, um, so that's one forum for disseminating collaborative um, research. The other is um, within our own institutions, um, having seminars within our own institutions between the groups, bringing you know uh, totally different fields together, engineering and medicine um, within the hospital, moving engineers into the hospital, um, and, and uh, we have a great example here. So I think there are small scale and large scale forms for sharing information, um, but it, it is a recognized challenge. Yeah, I'd echo that. The uh, It has been the challenge up to now is how do you get these two communities to work and, and uh, communicate together. And I think a lot of the initiatives we have going on here at U of T are directly addressing that. So the program we're involved with is putting biologists and engineers together on the same floor, intermixing the students so they share ideas and, and generate new ideas and putting us right within the center of the, the hospital network so that we're surrounded by uh, clinicians and, and connecting that way. And, you know, same with other programs, the Medicine by Design program, exact same thing. Engineers, computer scientists, biologists, stem cell, uh, stem cell biologists, and physicians all working together. So people recognize it, and there's 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 definitely a movement to to bridge those boundaries and, and break down those boundaries. It's required. I have a question for Dave Sinton from another um, tough customer named Moen, who asks, has work that's gone on in a university uh, ever actually impacted the means and the environmental impact with which bitumen is extracted? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, tremendous work, so in, in not my particular area, but in the in the water remediation um, and water reuse, uh, there was a huge. Uh, I would have mentioned a third black eye, I guess, in that area. And and to be fair, it's not it's not a hundred percent. But the 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 university, nose. what's that? Broken, broken nose. nose yeah. That's right. <laughs> but the uh, the the changes there through through collaborations in universities um, in Canada has been remarkable um, uh, to the point where now they say that some of these oil processing plants at the surface are really just water plants, water recycling plants. Uh, in, in, in my world, where we look at, at processes underground, you know, it's, it's fun for, for us and for our students because the, our collaborators, um, our, our partner companies, don't just want to hear from us to make sure that we're, we're doing something, um, but uh, are actually implementing, you know, making decisions on pilots based on what uh, these students are finding in the lab, which are what, what works better with, for the same amount of steam input, for instance, um, and how they can reduce their, their CO2 emissions for their operation. So you know, that's, that's fun and, and exciting. So there's lots of examples, my little one, but also many all across Canada. Wonderful, thank you. Um, I'm gonna ask a question from Rupak, which is still to our energy folks over here, um, which is what is the current price of energy and obviously the fluctuations in the price, including in fossil fuel sources, what does it do to the drive ultimately towards renewable energy when these price fluctuations in the current market for fossil fuels occur? How does it impact uh, the drive in, in the clean energy direction? There's only one answer, and that's it's really hard to predict. Mm -hmm. um, it's made it extremely hard for everybody in the short term on the renewable side because, you know, natural gas is three bucks a million. It hasn't been three bucks in 25 years. So, I mean, who's not going to use natural gas? Um, oil is whatever it is today, 37 bucks a barrel or something. It's, and that's before you get into the Alberta discount. Um, it's really hard to compete with these kinds of prices. But I think the key is uh, that, as Dave's indicated, the major power generation, whether it's coal, whether it's oil-fired, um, take a long time to turn over the capital stock. 
because they have you know a huge capital investment. Uh, and so they're kind of tight, and then when the price goes up, they're going to suffer again, and then the opportunity will be real again. Unfortunately, all this is mediated by whiz kids down on Bay Street, um, who are in it to make a buck rather than help us uh, make a more renewable world, or sustainable world. And uh, they drive some very peculiar behaviors, uh, particularly when you get into futures markets and things. So I, I suppose I shouldn't get off on that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going to go to an open round where I'm going to ask every panelist to toss out one thing. And you'll have about 10 or 20 seconds, or we could use less if you want to use less, to toss it out there. Uh, nobody has been prepared for this, so let's see what happens here. <clears throat> Suppose you were somebody who is completing an undergraduate degree in mechanical engineering today, or maybe you're finishing your PhD in mechanical engineering, and but it's it's today, it's 2015, and you're thinking about an area that can leverage the skills of a mechanical engineering student or researcher, and that's going to be exciting and have transformative impacts decades out. Where would you invest? Where would you place your bet? Where would you go if you were one of our students today graduating? What problem would you work on? I would become Goldie. I think what she does is the coolest thing in the world. I even tell my daughter about the cool stuff she does. <laughs> Sorry. Great answer. Only one person is allowed to use that answer, though. Chris is next. Uh, water treatment. More people die of bad water than anything else. I guess I'm, I'm probably blinded by what I think about all day, but I mentioned that energy is a slow changing uh, industry, so there's going to be lots of important work there for a long time, and, and the climate impacts are, uh, are significant and a growing challenge. I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, well, I don't save lives, so that, that's, you know, that's hard to do. I don't generate the energy that's needed for my robots to do anything that's over there, so I would say, you know, I think. If I, if I was me, I would really like, the, the great thing about mechanical engineering is that you don't have to focus in one area, but you can have this interdisciplinary um, uh, experience and training. And I think I would need those two really to c combine with my mechatronics or robotics background in order to be able to develop the next generation of technology. Uh, clearly the answer for, for me is uh, heart replacement technology. If I was a graduate student or an undergraduate, I'd seek out a group that's basically going to develop the next artificial heart, because that's going to have the greatest impact down the road. And Craig? I probably shouldn't say this, but I think it's energy, <laughs> not bio. <laughs> Maybe bioenergy, yeah, yeah. But uh, certainly interdisciplinary. I think that's where a lot of the, the, the future is definitely interdisciplinary, a lot of exciting, you know, a lot of exciting challenges that require the interdisciplinary approach. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, I would like to pay really sincere thanks to our audience for bringing us such great questions today. Thank you so much, audience, for uh, writing in with a whole bunch of really good and challenging and thoughtful and, and knowledgeable questions for us today. And I'd like to thank uh, all of our panel members for sharing with us your expertise, uh, your thoughts, uh, the benefits of your leadership, uh, and your deep understanding of how mechanical engineering is transforming our society and our world and our economy today. And how it will continue to do so in the future. So thank you so much.